It's like, hi guys, this is our little conversation about LTS. I know everyone's favorite topic. Uh, so I'm Mo, I'm, I work for Microsoft. Uh, and I have gathered some fun folks with all sorts of hats. So Micah, I know you've been working on working group LTS. Uh, I see Bridget, you're here. Uh, sadly, uh, Jordan's not here and Jeremy's not here, but we have them in spirit. Uh, I think Phil will join us hopefully shortly. And Rob, I know you love this topic from Gateway API, so I'm looking forward to your perspectives. Um, before we get started, so in case anyone wants to take any notes or anything, uh, I have QR codes there. Uh, I'm being told this is recorded, so I will be able to retroactively take notes on this, which will be good. But that stuff is there in case anyone wants to do that. Um, and I'll, I guess I'll put it back in a little bit in case anyone needs the link. Before we get started with our discussion and various topics, um, I wanted to signal boost uh, a thread that Jordan has started, which is basically how can we have releases that don't require you to have to read the release notes very carefully to make sure that you're not going to get broken when you upgrade your stuff, right? Uh, which you know comes down to a very strong and careful mentality around no action required, right? Uh, is that Phil? Okay, Phil, come on up. <laughs> I don't think Phil realized he was going to be on stage. <laughs> yes, we we need your container D representation because I think it. I'm sorry. <laughs> Right up here. All right. All right. But yeah, so uh, the link is there uh, for any, when I will publish the slides later. So, like, you know, if anyone wants to read the various docs and the stories around um, things that have gone well and things that have not gone so well on people's Kubernetes upgrades. Uh, so, yeah, so let's go on to the main topic, which are various conversations around LTS. Um, so, Micah, I think I might start with you because you had brought this up. Uh, so, it was about a year ago when we started conversations around last KubeCon EU. Right? So how's things going? Uh, yeah, so uh, last year at KubeCon EU, uh, who was here f last year? Okay, we got a few folks. Great, awesome. Yeah, so for you uh, who weren't, were not here, we had sort of an unconference time to talk about, hey, uh, Kubernetes releases last 14 months, and that's really painful. And there are uh, really, uh, there, there are a lot of customers that I see in, uh, from my own experience and a lot of people that I talk to who that just doesn't work for. Uh, they need a longer amount of time. They need, uh, the, the pace of change is a lot. Upgrading, even though Kubernetes now does three releases a year instead of four, that's still a lot of work. Um, and so we had a long, good conversation about what what does LTS mean? What does that look like? This, the, even the acronym LTS kind of is a little bit contentious, um, long-term support. Um, th that, that conjures up a lot of images or, or just uh, experience from people from maybe like a canonical Ubuntu LTS where you can skip versions like, should we apply that to Kubernetes? What about uh, downstream things or, or other dependencies, uh, ContainerD or Core DNS or CNI? Like, how do we coordinate that? Um, so that that was kind of the basis for the discussion we had last time. And your question, I guess, where we're at now is we now have a working group. Uh, there used to be a LTS working group a few years ago. And uh, working groups, if you're not familiar with Kubernetes governance, they um, SIGs are sort of long-lived and uh, generally own code. Not entirely all of them do, but um, they're open-ended. And working groups are typically formed around a specific problem. And in this case, LTS is kind of the question of what do we do? Uh, what what are things we can change? Does that mean we have, and not the answer is not yes to all these questions, but does that mean we have fewer releases a year? Does that mean we maintain releases longer? Does that mean we uh, allow skip upgrades? These are just kind of the questions that we're still trying to grapple with and answer and, and make things better. Um, so that's kind of the, the state of where we are now. Um, I don't know that we have 
actual answers to any, all of those or maybe even any of those questions yet. Um, but I think it, it's definitely something that we're exploring and I, um, just had a community survey about. So if you haven't seen those results, I think well, we're going to probably get into that a little bit. Um, Sorry, so did you have LTS survey results as part of this or? I did not do that. Okay, that's fine. Well, you can read, <laughs> you can read the survey results summary. It's on the LTS working group um, uh, uh, notes in, in Google Drive. Yeah, so that's the, this, the first QR code, the one on the left, that will take you there. All right, so thank you for that. So I guess I would ask you, uh, I have to maintain some, I'm sure you do too, on, oh, sorry. Close. sorry. <laughs> Things getting better for you for maintaining EOL stuff? Yes, so uh, I think, if you've been paying any, uh, or haven't been paying attention or just haven't haven't been close to this, um, a couple things that have gotten better over the last, not just, I think, year, but more than a, uh, a year, a couple years, uh, is new releases of Kubernetes only have V1 G, uh, GA features on by default. Uh, alpha features have always been off by default. Beta, historically, have been on. And that really got uh, a lot of us into trouble. Uh, how, how many of you experienced any fun or pain around PSP pod security policy deprecation? Okay, yeah, so, so people here are familiar with that. Um, that was an idea and it was stayed, it was also an earlier feature in the Kubernetes project lifecycle when beta things just sort of stayed in beta and didn't really graduate to GA or have a full GA plan. And that caught a lot of Kubernetes users off guard. Um, if you're an end user company, you're not necessarily reading Kubernetes release notes all the time. And you're just saying, okay, I'm gonna try and upgrade and see what breaks on my pre-production environment. And, oh wait, we have all these security controls in place around pod security policy. And then it's suddenly gone, what, what do we do? Or, or things like, uh, wait, what do you mean Docker is not supported anymore? Like in one, cube 124. Um, you mean, oh, oh, there's this container D thing. O okay, like, uh, uh, yeah, so, so safe, safer defaults are now the default. Um, another great, I think another big uh, item has been the Go version uh, support policy. So Jordan has done a ton of work in this um, uh, and worked with the, the Go folks to have a, if you're not familiar, so Kubernetes is built with Go. Go um, is the programming language in runtime. Go has a uh, very, very robust backward compatibility with the language, but not necessarily the behavior of the runtime or clients. So um, while the language will typically work and compile, um, it will work across versions, things like trying to think of like leading zeros in IP address parsing. Yeah. URL parsing. URL parsing. Those things can change where a leading zero used to not be an error and now suddenly it is. And so um, things like that would, would happen in, in Go. And so for Kubernetes to pick that up, that was a lot of work and required, it was breaking changes. Um, and additionally, uh, Kubernetes has its release cycle of 14, we maintain for 14 months, we release three times a year. Um, Go releases twice a year and maintains two releases. And they're not coordinated with Kubernetes releases. So it was the case where Kubernetes would release a branch midway through a, a Go version uh, life cycle and there might be six to, you know, lower case, or uh, lower bound six, upper bound a year um, of, of Go language support for that version of Go. And so Go would go, the version of Go Kubernetes would use would go end of life before that Kubernetes version was end of life. And so any CVE fixes or whatever were not backported to that version of Go and Kubernetes was still building with that. Um, and then if you tried to upgrade, you might hit issues. So the, the Go project has done a lot of work to maintain compatibility, um, I think at least two years, it still um, in new versions, but, at, but support backward uh, compatible behavior in each new version of Go f for up to like a two year period. So that, that encompasses all of basically each Kubernetes release. Um, but yeah, that, that's one other big line item I would say that, that, it, that matters a lot to uh, the security conscious folks. Um, yep. 
it doesn't necessarily, it's not necessarily something end users would feel or impact them um, a lot, but uh, yeah. Yeah, and, and Cube is special in the sense that like, I've worked on smaller Go projects and you just bump the Go version and it's just fine, like nothing happens, but with Cube, it is a process, like there is an issue and there's a series after series of regressions caused by some Go change and, and you very slowly work through it. And you know, of course somebody was using unsafe somewhere and it did a thing that made an assumption about a thing and that used to work and it no longer works and now Cube stops working and so you know, you've got to work through all those things. All right, so have we defined, now I guess I'll ask this all three of you, have you defined what LTS actually is yet? I spoke the last two ones, I get to go last. Maybe from Container D's perspective? Yeah, so um, I guess one interesting data point for us is that we did uh, start an LTS line for Container D. We announced, uh, I think we did announce at EU last year. Um, so Container D 1.6 is LTS and Again, interesting, there's no, you, you get to define what that means because there's no, you know, you can think of Ubuntu or what, whatever other LTS things you know of. So for us, we came up with a set of uh, statements about what that means for Containerd consumers. Um, it seems like it's been successful. It seems to, you know, make folks happy that they're not, uh, again, we have a bit of a longer train than uh, Kubernetes or Go. Um, probably every year on average we've done a, a minor release so we had you know one three one four one five one six one seven is our end of uh, kind of the 1.x line we just did uh, cut our release candidate for container d 2.0 yesterday um, I think it was yesterday maybe it was the middle of the night here uh, so essentially what 1.6 is providing is that stable base that people can rely on because we expect moving to Containerd 2.0 .0 is kind of a bigger uh, step for many people. Um, so the trick is what, what, how we defined LTS in reference to Kubernetes and the fact that the CRI API you know, continues to evolve is that the maintainers of Containerd will try as best we can to bring back, you know, CRI features into Containerd 1.6. So usually you think LTS, okay, there's no new features, it's just bug fixes, CVEs, uh, but we understand with Kubernetes marching forward, um, you know, if you adopt Containerd 1.6 LTS and then you can't use a new Kubernetes version, that kind of puts people in a, in a tough spot. So. Uh, so for us, you know, we haven't really, uh, we haven't existed long enough to really be tested on how, how that looks. But again, if, if you have suggestions for us or, you know, when we do hit that point, it's like, oh, well, how is Kubernetes 1.31 going to work with Containerd 1.6? Um, you know, we'll figure that out as we go. Yeah, so I'm here to represent uh, primarily Gateway API and Ingress and I think of those APIs as uh, some of the most broadly implemented and built upon APIs in the ecosystem. So we're not just thinking about the APIs, but we're thinking about all the tooling that's built around those APIs. Uh, there's 25 or 30 implementations of Ingress and Gateway, and then countless tools, CI, CD, et cetera, that also build on top of those APIs. Uh, and you think about that ecosystem and how painful it is for them to try to support all the different range of Kubernetes versions and API versions that exist. Uh, if you're familiar with the ingress v1 beta 1 to v1 change, I'm largely responsible for that pain. Sorry. Uh, I, I am very, very aware of the pain that causes now uh, and am doing everything I can to avoid that going forward. And so although we don't have anything that's called LTS, we thought or I thought, oh, we'll solve this by doing this really cool thing of supporting the trailing five Kubernetes versions at least with every Gateway API release because Gateway API is CRDs, right? So we can just, you can take our release and deploy it on any Kubernetes cluster. You're gonna get probably 95% 
of Kubernetes clusters just with that promise, and we aim for even more. And that was, I thought that covered everyone, and then somebody decided to start an LTS conversation, and well, you know, now what do we do? Uh, so it, it, it introduces pain points there, but then you look at it from the other side, there's some really great work going on in this ecosystem, whether it's uh, cool new features coming to CRDs, uh, whether it is storage version migration, all these things that Gateway API and others would really benefit from. And LTS, by extension, unfortunately, delays our adoption of those things, or we as Gateway API have to say, well, if you're using this version of Kubernetes, you can use this version of our release, and then, you know, like we have to segment our releases out and then create, create all that pain for controllers and the entire ecosystem. Or we wait, I don't know, 10 releases until it's safe to use, you know, the, the new CRD ver features, which also are very slowly rolling out. And, you know, it's, it's an unfortunate, we're all trying to be safe and we're all trying to provide as broad support as possible, but unfortunately, the direction that Gateway API decided to provide something resembling LTS, but not called LTS, actually works against the, the other LTS uh, discussion here. What was the original question again? <laughs> I was just taken by these two guys' answers. I'm trying to remember which one I asked on this one, <laughs> because the answers were so broadly different. One was about uh, Containerd and Gateway API. Um, I, I guess I would just make a quick comment. So maybe thinking off of what you just said, Rob. So I think at least from the outside, when you think about LTS, you know, you're going to see a lot of positives, right? You're like less, less churn, less, uh, less work to just, you know, because at the end of the day, your job is probably not like maintaining a Kubernetes cluster, right? It's like delivering customer value, using stuff running on top, right? But there is a world where folks like Gateway API never adopt new features because they're too desperate to keep old versions working. And then how do we get usage and feedback from features, right? How do you actually promote something from beta to GA if no one has ever used it? Um, like, and, and by, I mean, no one, I mean like anyone outside of the people that developed it. Obviously we tried it and it probably worked for the two use cases we had. Um, yeah, no, I, that, that's exactly it. I, I've asked, you know, teams for, hey, can, can we have this cool new feature for CRDs? Then they deliver it, and then a year later, I provide feedback because it's that long until we can actually pick it up and use it in Gateway API, and that's, that's being generous. A year is probably not quite long enough. Uh, but yeah, it's an, an unfortunate consequence of how we've decided to build, you know, a long set of release support of just five releases, but then you bundle that on top of LTS, which is more, and I'm not entirely sure where we land. Oh. Yeah, I think this goes in like to some of the second bullet point, right? Like, at least in Kubernetes, mm -hmm. as far as I understand, we're not taking the container D route, uh, thus we are not going to, at, at this point, backport any features, right? So that means projects like Gateway API, if they support an LTS, that means all of those features for the last N years are not available to them because you, you can't use a feature if it doesn't exist in the cluster that you're on. But maybe stepping back on the what is the LTS uh, question, I think there's strong agreement on security fixes because I don't really know what else LTS would have. Yeah, I, I think that that's definitely true. Um, I think security fixes. I think there's there's definitely an in strong interest in sort of critical bug fixes, like if like a bug in existing feature or you know data corruption or um, sort of non-security but but consequential um, um, bugs as well. Yeah, I left the question mark on all bug fixes. I think the data tells us that we can't do that because uh, when Jordan had compiled um, sort of like the health of various release cycles, um, one of the biggest things we noticed from that data set is we cause a non-trivial amount of regressions backporting things. So I think we have to hold ourselves very honest to the fact that the data shows that things aren't so easy and clear when you backport them. So you really need to have a good reason. It can't just be well, someone might benefit from this. It really does have to be, no, I, I know why I'm doing this. Um, Phil, maybe for you. So 
uh, 1.30 is about to come out for Kubernetes. And 2.0 of Containerd is not ready, or it's almost ready, but not there. But we're going to miss you guys. So how, how did that impact the fact that we are building a new release on like 1.7 instead of 2.0? Um, impact in which way? Like, uh, Did it change uh, any support life cycles for you or any thought process around? I think you said 1.6 is LTS, right? So Yeah, so 1.6 is LTS and I... What's 1.6's date and end date? Yeah, so 1.6 we are supporting through at least February next year, I want to say. Um, yeah, I should bring up the readme on my phone so I can actually say the right things. Um, so we actually just had a PR in the last few weeks trying to make sure that our... So we have a, a table in our actually releases.md, not readme, uh, that gives you a table of Kubernetes version, uh, API version, and Containerd version support matrix. And so uh, we were just updating that for getting ready for 1.30 so that consumers know, you know, what, what matches up. So... Um, I think we're going to be fine that 1.6 and 1.7 will both uh, be available when 1.30 is released. And 2.0, uh, yeah, I can't predict our, we just cut an RC as I said yesterday, but we're very close to 2.0 being released. Yeah. Uh, I guess it's, it is just the way things are, but it'd be kind of nice if we could somehow magically align all the stars. But the reality yep. is we can't make Containerd, Kubernetes, Go, and everybody else to say, yeah. I release on February 2nd, and that's when we're going to release. Right. Right. It just doesn't work that way. Yeah, and I, just a comment while I have the mic, um, since I, I want to be super careful. So you mentioned Kubernetes won't be like Containerd backporting features. So... I, I think there's going to be maintainer discretion about, you know, sometimes adding a new, a new CRI API is just wiring the CRI API to a feature we already have in the core of Container D. That's a much simpler discussion because, like, the checkpoint uh, CRI API, um, you know, we didn't have to change core Container D code. We added basically the implementation of the CRI API endpoint to use the existing checkpointing code in container D. So, you know, those are the kinds of, of you know, decision, nuance of what does it mean for an LTS of container D to support new uh, Kubernetes features. So we'll be, I think, having to make that, you know, as a case-by-case -case basis. And there are other things that we've discussed that it's like, wow, that's, that would be significant changes to container D core code base that may not, you know, we may just not be able to do that. So, yeah. That makes me feel better. I, I, thought, it was, I thought it was much broader. Um, I guess maybe the last thing I would say is, so thinking about the cost of LTS to Kubernetes and related projects, right? How do we deal with the fan out of Kubernetes LTS, right? Um, because at the end of the day, when you tell a customer that, you know, you have an LTS environment, um, they're not just, they don't mean just Kubernetes, they almost certainly mean the host, but they also certainly mean the things running on that platform, right? Because part of LTS for them is mostly, well, I want to limit the change to this environment, uh, you know, maybe because I'm in a regulated industry or I have very specific times within the year I'm allowed to make changes or, or whatever other constraints a customer is in. Uh, so any thoughts on that, guys? Yeah, uh, you know, one of my thoughts is I, I, I wonder if this is something that is, uh, well, first, it's going to be very challenging. I, I am very familiar with, you know, just the ecosystem that I, I live in, which is Ingress, Gateway, and, and that, that world, that there's a lot of controllers that want to have one release that supports the broadest range of clusters possible, right? And then that's it. And they don't want to have this release for, you know, version 122 and above and this older release for the rest. It's going to be challenging. I can imagine that every individual product will have to de decide if they want to support LTS. So if you're an ingress controller, maybe that's a 
per project decision that I want to support this older mode and this is you know what that means. Maybe for Gateway API as a sub-project of Kubernetes, we need to decide we'll support, this is not a commitment, this is a maybe we might decide you know, uh, but you know, maybe maybe there's a world where we decide that we will support some subset of our capabilities, GA only, LTS, legacy, CRDs that don't have any of the fancy new features. I don't know. It, it, it's a, a cost to every project, and this is just my little corner of the world. Yeah, I, I think one of the other costs to consider is going to be, um, and, and, and it's it's definitely a cost, but I think it's also clarity um, for the ecosystem on top of Kubernetes. Um, like, uh, obviously we work closely with, uh, Kubernetes works closely with Containerd and and um, some other, you know, core, core dependencies, but think about like, you know, FluentBit, FluentD, um, any other project that sort of runs on top of Kubernetes. Um, they're going to either have to decide, like, do we do what? What do we do about this? So, so the cost also will extend beyond beyond the scope of the project itself. I, I to your point though, and your question, yeah, there, there's definitely going to be a cost in terms of saying, okay, I, I'm on the security committee with Mo. Um, now, now we're going to accept security reports for not versions not just from the last 14 months, but from the last, you know, potentially two years. Um, that's kind of the the time range we're thinking about um, or maybe it's who knows maybe it's 26 months I don't know um, we haven't exactly gotten to where yeah we haven't exactly figured that out yet but um, that that's a long time like if, if, if no one's touched code in in almost two years like uh, other than backporting security fixes like th that's a, a lot bigger surface area um, so th I, I think it's it's also those yeah those cross-cutting uh, and, and SIG release, right? Like SIG release is going to have to have um, have more more people spending more time on these releases and being able to cut them still. All right, y'all. I think with that, if anyone has any questions in the audience, uh, I see a hand. Uh, thanks for continuing to push on this. Um, I've always said I think it's not maintaining a release for longer. Uh, for the end user, it's what happens at the end of that LTS. Uh, and what I observe is customers drift to the last maintained version and extended support and then get bumped exactly four months, which means they live in exactly the same world. They're just time shifted back a year. Um, so we're just making it observably worse for every consumer of LTS. Um, and I think we really have to address that. We have to make it uh, better to upgrade, safer to upgrade, and that's where we're putting our time and energy and uh, would love some more help and support on that. Another comment, you talked about the ecosystem on top of Kubernetes um, and a cost there. Uh, one thing I haven't heard is what's underneath Kubernetes. Um, the base OS image, um, if I read the AWS terms of service right, you just bump the AWS Linux um, when it needs to happen, which is kind of disingenuous when you talk about an LTS. Uh, and I think that's the only reasonable solution to that problem. Uh, and so I think it's kind of misleading uh, that we can and should uh, support an open source LTS. I'm all for leaving release branches in a great state. Um, if that becomes a need for regulatory reasons, I get it. Um, but I think the transitive dependencies of the Kubernetes community make it really difficult. Um, and final point, the path that Go went was not to maintain versions of Go for two, three years, but to implement compatibility mode for older versions. Um, and that reduces the surface area where they have to implement security fixes and so on. And I'd love to see more exploration of that idea uh, in Kubernetes too. Thanks. Y'all mean comment? Um, so some of the stuff that's at least a little bit related to uh, the comments you made 
Um, we have seen designs uh, that uh, have firmed up the amount of cubelet drift you can have from your control plane. Uh, so that makes it easier to do upgrades across many releases because cubelets require draining them if you want to be safe, which control plane does not. Uh, the other thing is, um, um, I forget the number of the cap, but there is a design for um, within like certain constraints, like say for example, you only use uh, GA features. Uh, we could maybe allow you to do a skip upgrade of your control plane. So instead of having to go from you know 125 to 126, you could go from like 125 to 128. Uh, but yeah, I think you are right that LTS on its own, like supporting releases for longer does not inherently solve the problem of upgrades are painful and they cause stress and just feel dangerous so people avoid them until they're stuck. And well, yeah, if you're stuck two years behind versus one year behind, you're right, it's, you're still stuck. Um, oh. Yeah, maybe, maybe I'll just address one more thing. It, one of the things I've seen common in LTS in, as it's evolved is that there's a premium to pay for LTS among vendor support, right? Uh, one of the questions I'd have is when it comes to a pure open source project like Gateway API, how do we, how do we fund that support, right? Because it's a significant additional cost if we were to support that, but it's not, it, we don't send a bill to anybody for providing Gateway API or open source Kubernetes or whatever that is. Like, I know this is a much broader question, but I think that's part of the LTS discussion. No comment. <laughs> so yeah, um, the I think a lot of what you said is completely true, and is uh, a lot of the reason why in the in the initial uh, iteration of LTS, like we managed to get what we did done in the what was it, Tim? Three years? Yeah, three years. I think it was that we were that, we, that the working group was active previously. Um, the biggest change that came out of it was the uh, change to this version skew policy and the release cadence so that it to move to 14 months instead of nine months right because at the time when we were doing that it, the support cadence the support window was nine months which meant that for a lot of people they're like oh I can only really safely do upgrades once a year um, you know in the quiet period after Christmas for non-retail ones and in, for retail people it's the opposite right uh, and so that everybody was screwed in that case and so you know, things are getting better and I think that the the stuff about um, safe upgrades is really is the key to this stuff like like you say the the key here is like LTS as you, is you put it a good way that LTS like kicks can down the road and gives everybody a problem like in another 12 months or whatever um, of how then how do you get from one LTS to another and you need skip upgrades or safe upgrades or you know being able to turn backwards compatibility modes or something like that. And so we need those things anyway to make upgrades easier. And so that's why I think people have been putting the, rather than saying, let's just do an LTS, it's better to put the effort towards making upgrades easier so that then when we want to do it, when we do want to do an LDS, it's more achievable and it's more, it's safer for, for end users to be able to upgrade. You know, if you can do skip upgrades, doing an LTS is much less a big deal. Um, in terms of upgrading, and so yeah, like I think that the uh, where we're at is a pretty good spot. That the the working group is doing a great job of like identifying things that we can do to make the upgrades easier, and that's one of the reasons why I think from the outside it can look like we're not making any progress on LTS. It's like well we are, but we can't like give, we just marking something as LTS is going to end up with way more pain than than doing the job right. Yeah, uh, thanks again for the discussion. Uh, I, my question is related to how we are uh, sort of maintaining uh, Go version upgrades in, in the Kubernetes project. So that's one of the areas that I help out with. And I think some, I think Jago mentioned uh, Go making those changes. And so far, Kubernetes has probably been one of the biggest influencers to why Go did those changes to begin with. Uh, and Go isn't 
changing its release cadence so it's still supporting the last two versions but if we do an lts um, it's going to be that many more release branch bumps that we need to do uh, so like I i'm just curious about if you've thought about not just the ecosystem on top of kubernetes but the things that kubernetes consumes as well because uh, you have a huge fan out in terms of the infra infrastructure that you will be using in order to test these for example go uh, version bumps out right because uh, uh, each Go version has two RCs that we necessarily need to test out in order to get the feedback uh, to the Go team in place on time. So I'm just like curious about if you've thought about the, the dependencies that are consumed by Kubernetes rather than Kubernetes as a, de as a dependency itself. Yeah, I think it's, it's definitely been something we've discussed. Um, I think because of the way that Go is, is doing this where you can have configuration to um, support specific you know, functionality. I think the idea is that we can we can keep bump versions of Go, but keep that old compatibility. So you're right; there is maintenance there in terms of of specifying the version or the features necessarily. But the idea is, again, with testing, that we can have that guarantee that the functionality is the same. Um, I'm not; it's not something I'm super close to, but that's my understanding of it. So. If, if we keep more versions around longer because we're doing long-term version support, also for ourselves, just the infrastructure costs to keep all that CI around. We already do things like the older releases test less frequently, but that only gets us so far. You still need to be able to test patches that are coming in and you have to keep all of that running. And that stuff's pretty expensive and only a few of the vendors are actually backing this. Um, how do we get people who want LTS to help pay for the costs. Like there's the engineering time and there's also all the resources we need to qualify it. That's a great question. And I don't know that I have a great answer to that. I think this goes back to what you said earlier, Rob, is that the impact of LTS on open source is hard to like amortize because there isn't a path to revenue in that stream because you don't have a customer relationship. You have a, like a, an end user to community maintainer relationship, right? But there's no money being exchanged. Uh, in the same way, uh, we don't, we're not like charging anyone for running extra branches because we don't have anyone to charge. It's the opposite. We actually pay like, and testers to or no, people who find bugs, <laughs> security bugs in Kubernetes. Yeah. Yep. And so now we're just paying them longer. I mean, yeah. So I don't, I don't think I have a good answer there other than, I don't know, three big cloud providers, please show up and donate tons of credits. Um, not a great answer. Okay, there is also this associated cost to run more tests, more branches for the project, right? So, and people's time. That's something that we need to factor in this equation. Yeah, I, I think it just comes down to the fact that uh, we don't have revenue coming in from open source things because that's not how they work, right? That's just not the spirit of that, uh, that entire uh, premise, right? Thanks. Um, I think Rob brought up the other point that's really critical is the fragmentation and the not adopting new features for longer. A um, couple years ago, that wouldn't have bothered me as much, but I think what we'll see at this KubeCon again is all about AI, ML, and inference is the new web app. Um, and I really see it as an existential risk for Kubernetes to get pinned at 127 where dynamic resource allocation and multi-network doesn't exist and we end up in a Python 2.7 versus 3.x scenario. Um, so I think we really need to weigh the benefits of LTS against the risk of displacement completely or fragmentation. Um, I don't want to live in a world where vendors and users have to know what version of a Kubernetes they're running on and behave completely differently. Um, so I think that's a real risk and I don't see it in the LTS discussion enough, I think. Please come 
specific, you know, Jacob, you specifically, but anyone who's interested and has thoughts here, please do come to the um, biweekly LTS meeting. We like we want to have these conversations. Um, so if you if you feel like something, those are Tuesdays at ten, right? Ten Tuesdays uh, at. It's like, is it like at ten Eastern? Yeah, yeah. Seven Pacific. Seven Pacific. It's like terrible for a Pacific Coast. <laughs> We we do get e, we we try to cover EU as well there, but yeah, it's tough. Yeah, that's actually a really good point because we've already kind of with Container D, we've made some hard decisions for folks who wanted to, to adopt NRI, which we put in 1.7 uh, node resource interface that enables some of the. Uh, work around dynamic resource, you know, basically inserting devices into the containers config, OCI config. Um, so 1.7 had a bunch of experimental features that are going to be GA and 2.0, but folks that were playing around with inference and using containers for ML basically had to choose container D 1.7 to use NRI, which gets them off of 1.6 is an LTS, so yeah, you know, these are the complications that don't really have good answers, but you know, that's a very concrete example of the choices people are having to make. Yeah, I mean, very related to that, one of the things I, I can't help but think that is if we go too far down this path, do we end up in a world where everything moves out of tree? Like, is, is it just too expensive? to develop anything in tree because your LTS users are two years behind, or I don't know what, what that might be, right? Uh, and then do you have a million gateway-like projects that may not be the end of the world, but it is another significant threat that we need to understand. Is that an outcome we want? Uh, I, I'm not sure. I was about to say that that almost seems relatively desirable. Like, you move everything out of the tree, and then the tree can be stable, like, and then it doesn't matter so much. There's less churn in the tree, so, you know, you can have the core parts that everyone is using be relatively stable, and then you add on the bits, and it's up to the you, the operator, to decide how, you know, how alpha you're going to be. And that the flip positive side of that is it also gives you better experimentation, right? Like, oh, I want to try this, like pre-production uh, feedback. Yeah, you, you, get, you get back into the loop, right? Like, if, oh, I'm depending on this pre-production thing and it breaks. But from a core project perspective, it gives better experimentation because you're not bound necessarily to that release cycle. Yeah, I mean, I think Gateway API is the, is the sort of canonical example here where it's like, well, right now, we're still depending on this stuff because CIDs need evolution. But you, it, hopefully, hopefully at some point, CIDs will be finished enough that we can be like, look, we don't need any more changes now from this version. Hopefully. I said hopefully. Yeah, let, let's just wait till everything good about CRDs is merged, and then we can talk about LTS after that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. That, that's the point I'm making. But I mean, presumably there's some sort of like uh, asymptotic effect here where like, you know, at some point there will be less and less and less changes required. So maybe just a little counter to that, right? Sometimes you do encounter things that you cannot build out of tree, right? And so what do we do then? And do, do we ever get any feedback there? Uh, and on the CRD thing, right? Like the rule basically now is if you build this functionality for like core APIs, you have to have a mechanism to express that in CRDs at some point, right? So like I think back to when we added warnings, right? We, we could have implemented it very quickly for entry, but then we're like, no, we got to add it to like like, you know, webhooks, like uh, conversion webhooks need to be able to send warnings and other things because we didn't want to lose parity with that external system. Right? So it's still going to evolve indefinitely. And one day it might have another new feature that Gateway API wants. And then you'll be like, well, I guess I don't get to use that for two years now. Anyone else? I think we might be done. Okay, since I have the mic in hand, I am going to ask a question myself. This is a good uh, checkpoint of where we're at. 
but I would love to hear from each of you where you think we're going to go. What conversation are we going to be having at the next KubeCon about this? Where do you want this to go? So personally, I, I think where I would love this to go is where we have, um, I think, some form of extended support, especially for security fixes. I think that's probably table stakes, and I think most there's pretty broad consensus there, um, just because it can be hard for people to move. And um, I think there's definitely recognition that, like, I know at least AWS I can speak for, and I, and I know from Microsoft too, that, that they're already doing this work, right? Like, we're, we're backporting, um, we're, we're upgrading old versions uh, of, of, you know, Go and old versions of Kubernetes, and we're backporting security fixes because we have to be FedRAMP compliant. And um, and so, so it's work that we're, like, already doing. and. And so I think, I think getting that a little more formalized and, and not all doing it so siloed just makes sense. Um, I think these other questions around skip versions are great questions. I don't know, I don't know the answer to, to where that's going, but I, I think that's in my mind that the sort of the security and critical bug fixes is kind of the, we have the most consensus and, and is in some ways the easiest part to agree on. Uh, speaking purely as a gateway maintainer, I'm really hoping that uh, we can keep the community experience as good as it possibly can be with minimal additional cost to maintainers of the project, right? So uh, what, what that means from my perspective is I want to be able to release a set of CRDs and gateway API uh, that can be available to 95 plus percent of Kubernetes users. Uh, and I also want to have some kind of path to use the latest and greatest CRD features within the next year or two. I don't know how we achieve those two goals because it feels like they're, they're pushing against each other. But that's really, you know, if, if I had a wish list, that would be it. Uh, Mike could drag me into this discussion. Uh, but I guess from a container D perspective, um, I think if, if both Kubernetes and Containerd have ideas of LTS, it probably makes a lot of sense for us to be better synced. Um, when I see Don here, and I'm Containerd is is uh, very poorly represented at Signode. I think as a just a maintainer team, I think Mike Brown is probably there usually, but uh, it sits on my calendar, and I always feel bad that I don't join. But um, but yeah, I think better alignment of like, okay, if you're gonna have multiple projects with a definition of LTS, then there probably should be some better alignment to make sure we're not making it extremely confusing about how that works together. Yeah, so I think for me personally, I want us to start solidifying like what the path to like a skip version actually looks like. And I think that requires us to, um, I'm forgetting the name of the design that some folks have had, I think Jordan was part of them, where um, we were talking about like, I don't know if it was feature sets or it was like, it was just reducing the scope of like compatibility um, mix matches that you would have across upgrades. But just in general, like, I think we're at the point in the life cycle of our project that upgrades are much more critical than perhaps they were in the past. Right? Like they shouldn't induce fear, they shouldn't cause stress. Um, I don't know how we get there, but I'd love to have more upgrade tests in you know open source CI. Uh, it's just you know if you look at a Kep, you know there's a. I I, I know Dims. I I didn't want to say it out loud because it hurts <laughs> to say it out loud. We have no upgrade tests. Um, I know. There, there, there's like jobs that upgrade clusters. There are not upgrade tests. There, and there's very few of those even. There, there's really not much investment in this right now. Um, that's part of why I'm mean a bit skeptical. Uh, no, <laughs> um, that's there's why a I feel ton bad of investment you... just with the current set of releases around how do users sustain this that, that's missing. Yeah, so like when you review a cap, right, or when you write a cap in the document is like, did you manually upgrade test this? 
And I'm like, at what point? Like once in like the feature life cycle? I'm, yeah, sure. I totally did that. I promise. Not that I have any proof. So th th there is so there is some sort of a greatest that caught some regression that is what Fabrizio and this cube admin kind of work, jobs are doing. But there is another problem that is higher than this is there is no testing of different features enabled at the same time. And if you add this as a, an upgrade, then it's even worse. So we we don't we, we remove one beta feature and we demote to alpha because when we were running with other features at the same time, it was breaking the cluster. So it's just not upgrade per upgrade. It's a grade plus all the things that are running in the cluster has to work at the same time. And that's that's why I think this is a very big problem that we need all of us to invest time on that and, and figure out how to solve. Just not that great. That great plus all the things that are running and all very good points. Uh, I'd like to make one public plea uh, to not make the number of months of support an arms race. Um, if one vendor supports two years, then another, and then the first one supports three, and then the other, and then the next one supports four years, and then the other. Um, then we really won't get past 124 or 5 or 6 ever. Um, so if you are involved in those conversations at your vendor, um, please uh, suggest that this creates a strain on the community. Um, and we need those people to actually be merging security patches upstream for the versions we already committed to support because those people are short staffed already. So thanks. All right, I see, I think the next folks for the next thing coming in. So I think we're out of time. So thank you all. Thanks.